Hello, welcome to the world of Eichert, where we learn how to think like the College Board. And if you can think like the College Board, you can get a five on the AP exam. My name is Mr. Eichert. I'm an AP World History teacher, and these are my students. And today's video is a special review lesson for Unit 1, The Global Tapestry. All of the topics from Unit 1 will be covered, and we're going to review them using the framework of the six historical themes, as well as the three history thinking processes. We believe that's the best way to review. At the end of the lesson, we'll also look at some AP exam examples from previous years, so we can see how our knowledge of the content and the skills can get us results in real life. Let's start with governance, aka political stuff. This is the most important theme in Unit 1. How do we know that? Look in the course and exam description. The C-E-D. Yes. If we look there, we see that governance comes up in literally every topic of Unit 1. So, governance. Let's take this theme and do a comparison of the different states we see in Unit 1. 1.1 has the Song Dynasty. Like the Chinese dynasties that came before, it is a highly centralized state with a large imperial bureaucracy. The bureaucrats who work for this bureaucracy are scholars who have passed the civil service examination, which is largely based on knowledge of Confucianism. The government also uses the Confucian ideas of strict hierarchies and obedience to authority to justify its imperial rule. We should also note that the Song Dynasty has lost significant territory to rival states, such as the Jin Dynasty and the Western Xia, which are states that are led by nomadic or semi-nomadic peoples. 1.2, Dar al-Islam, looks a bit different. We start off with the Abbasid Caliphate, which was at one point huge and very powerful, but by 1200 can barely be called a state. You still have the Caliph in Baghdad, and he's still the spiritual leader of Sunni Islam, but the Caliphate at this point is fragmented into many different states. So we can compare with the Song Dynasty here. Both China and the Abbasids are weaker and smaller than they were in the past. But the Song Dynasty still has a decent chunk of China under its control, and what it has is still a highly centralized imperial bureaucracy. On the other hand, within the Abbasid Caliphate, there are multiple new Muslim states, many led by Turkic peoples. The three the College Board mentions are the Seljuks, the Mamluks, and the Delhi Sultanate. They are all led by sultans, who only really defer to the Abbasid Caliph on religious and spiritual matters. Politically, they do what they want. And all of these are very powerful states with very effective military. These Turkic states also continue to expand the rule and influence of Islam. So even though the Abbasid Caliphate is in decline in the year 1200, Islam and Islamic rule is definitely not. Another comparison we could make with China is the use of belief systems to justify and legitimize their rule. While the Chinese emperors use Confucianism, the leaders of the states in Dar al-Islam also use a belief system to justify their their rule. Islam. For the Abbasid Caliphs, this was much simpler. As the deputies of the Prophet Muhammad, they had clear religious legitimacy as the leaders of the Ummah, the Muslim community. The leaders of these states, the sultans, got their spiritual legitimacy more indirectly, often by getting official approval from the Abbasid Caliph himself. 1.3 South and Southeast Asia has a whole slew of states, but fortunately none of them are in the required content section. You should be familiar with at least a couple of them. Your choice, really. And you need to understand that they are Buddhist, or Hindu states. So I recommend being familiar with at least one Buddhist state and at least one Hindu state, as well as understanding that South Asia is basically India and the surrounding regions, and that Southeast Asia is this area down here. Vijayanagara is my go-to Hindu state because it's big, it's populous, and lasts a long time, therefore probably pretty important. And it also fits in nicely with the Delhi Sultanate that we talked about in 1.2. Many Hindus who fled the Muslim armies in the north settled in the Vijayanagara state. We can compare how Hinduism helped to unify the people in Vijayanagara in the same way that Islam helps to unify these Muslim states. Most of the leaders of all of these states on this list use either Hinduism or Buddhism to help to legitimize their rule. The rulers of Vijayanagara claim to have divine authority, either from one or many of the various gods in the Hindu pantheon. Also importantly, the rulers sponsored the building of Hindu temples, and sponsoring religious buildings also helps to legitimize their rule. Exactly. We see similar patterns of using religion to get legitimacy in all of these states. For example, the Sinhala dynasties of Sri Lanka were Buddhist. They sponsored the building of Buddhist temples, and they even employed Buddhist monks as political advisors. In all these other states, you will see that the rulers are somehow affiliated either with Hinduism or Buddhism, and they use religion to increase or justify their authority. In 1.4, we take a very brief look at the Americas. Honestly, this is kind of a token topic, and there is really very little that the College Board 
Board wants you to know. Mainly, they just want you to understand that there are states in the Americas before 1450, not just tribes of people, as many people today still wrongly think. The big ones are the Mexica, aka the Aztecs, and the Inca. The Mexica Empire was a highly militarized state that used its military power to establish a system of tribute with its vassal states supplying materials and sometimes people to the Mexica center of power. Like all the other states we mentioned, the Mexica rulers also used religion to justify and legitimize their rule. In fact, many of the Mexica emperors also served as high priests for the empire. You should know that yes, they did use human sacrifice to quench their god's thirst for human blood, but that's not all they did. They had huge infrastructure projects and very advanced agricultural technologies. And their capital, Tenochtitlan, was one of the largest cities in the world at the time. You want monumental architecture? The Mexica were really good at that too. The Inca in the Andes Mountains of South America were also highly sophisticated and included a diversity of peoples. Like the Mexica, and for that matter, the Song or the Abbasids or those Turkic states, the Inca also sponsored large infrastructure projects, most famously their roads, which were critical for you uniting and ruling their vast empire. And like the Mexica and those Turkic Muslim states from 1.2, the Inca Empire was largely built through military conquest. And you could probably guess where I'm going with this. Like all these other states, the Inca also used religion to help legitimize their rule, as the Inca rulers were closely associated with the sun god. And they also built some pretty amazing architecture. These other states are kind of honorable mentions. You should know that they are all states and that they all had their own own accomplishments. 1.5 is also kind of a token unit. It's not a big part of the exam and a superficial knowledge is probably okay. But similar to the Americas, the College Board wants you to understand that there were significant states in Africa before 1450. Uh, Mr. Eichard, what about Mali and the Swahili Coast city-states? Aren't those important African states in the period 1200 to 1450? Yes, Mali and the Swahili Coast city-states are hugely important states, but the College Board is saving them for Unit 2 because they're related to the spread of Islam and trade routes. Unit 1 is more looking at the pre-Islamic states in Africa. Great Zimbabwe was a powerful and rich state located near the coast of East Africa. Like many of the states in Unit 1, they enriched themselves by controlling important trade routes. And again, architecture. In fact, that's probably what Great Zimbabwe is most famous for, its massive and sophisticated architecture. Ethiopia is a unique one in Africa. It's the most ancient of the three states that the College Board mentions in the CED. It's been around since biblical times. And it was an important state mentioned by ancient Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, and many more. They were one of the earliest states to adopt Christianity as their official religion. We'll see in Unit 2 that Islam sweeps through most of Africa. But Ethiopia maintains its Christian identity, and it still does to this very day. Let me guess, the Ethiopian rulers used Christianity to legitimize their authority. You got it. They sponsored the building of many churches throughout their state. Many rulers even claimed to be descended from the biblical king Solomon. Last on the list is Europe. We don't have any illustrative examples to go off here, but that's actually a good thing because it lets us know that we don't really need to know too much detail. The main thing you need to know about Europe is it's decentralized for a few reasons. Firstly, Europe is divided into many different states. The biggest ones in the West are France and England, but even they're pretty small. And these states are very often in conflict with each other, aka they fight a lot. But every now and then some of them get together and go fight other people, specifically the Muslims in the Middle East and North Africa, which is what we call the Crusades. But even within these small states, power is not as centralized as it is in other places, particularly China. In Europe, kings and other rulers of states practice feudalism. To simplify, feudalism is a political system in which power is divided. A common example is to imagine a king granting authority to a group of lords, each of whom can basically manage their own region independently. In return, they would pledge loyalty to the king, give him a share of the taxes, and obey the king's laws. We've also got the manor system, sometimes also referred to as manorialism. This refers to isolated pieces of land called manors, in which most of the economic activity was contained inside. The idea is that everything you need for society to function is produced within that manor. The food is all grown there. The manufactured goods are all made by local artisans, and there's very little trade with the outside world. Of course, there are some important trading cities in Europe, but the scale of trade is much smaller than what you see in China, in South Asia, Southeast Asia, or the 
the Middle East. How did the leaders of European states legitimize and justify their rule? Christianity. Wow, you guys are really good students. Many kings in Europe would be crowned by religious leaders from the Roman Catholic Church. For example, the local archbishop, or in some cases, even the pope himself. Uh, Mr. Eichert, is that similar to the Turkic sultans getting legitimacy from the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad? Yes, that is a very good comparison. Since we're talking about belief systems, we'll move on to the second most important theme in Unit 1, culture. And for Unit 1, culture mostly refers to belief systems. First of all, the College Board wants you to know the enormous cultural impact that China had on the rest of East Asia. Aside from China, East Asia also means Japan and Korea. Sadly for them, we don't really need to care about their states or political systems in this time period. What we need to understand is how they were culturally influenced influenced by China. Conveniently, they give us some examples. Filial piety, the idea that we should respect our elders, is big in China and it spreads to Korea and Japan. We've also got Neo-Confucianism and the importance of Buddhism throughout Asia. Buddhism, of course, originates in India, but by 1200, it's already firmly established in China. How did it get there? I know, I know, merchants and missionaries on the Silk Road. Belief systems spreading along trade routes is a major focus of AP World History. And by 1200, Buddhism is also big in Japan and Korea. Now we can also see that the College Board wants us to know about the core beliefs of Buddhism, which is also mentioned in 1.3. To oversimplify, Buddhism's main goal is to end suffering by ending desire. And this can all be done by following the Eightfold Path. Now you've got many branches of Buddhism. In one of my other videos I go into a lot more depth about this, but for our purposes now let's just say that Mahayana Buddhism is much more popular in East Asia, while Theravada Buddhism is more popular in Southeast Asia. And by the way, how did Theravada Buddhism get to Southeast Asia? Trade. Yes, specifically this time on the Indian Ocean trade routes. Since we're in South and Southeast Asia, let's also talk about Hinduism. Like Buddhism, it came from India and then spread throughout South and Southeast Asia on the Indian Ocean trade routes. Similarities between Hinduism and Buddhism include, they both believe in reincarnation and a cyclical view of time. Both of them have some form of enlightenment in which souls can escape from this cycle. Both have the concepts of Dharma and Karma. Major differences are first that Hinduism has many deities where Buddhism, at least at first, does not acknowledge any gods. Finally, a key part of Hinduism is the caste system, while Buddhism rejects this notion and is more socially egalitarian. But you should probably know that in each of these states, you would likely find both Hindus and Buddhists, and as time goes on, more and more Muslims. In fact, we'll see in Unit 2 that some of these states will actually be replaced by new Muslim states. So let's talk about the core beliefs of Islam then, and while we're at it, Judaism and Christianity too. They're all monotheists theistic, and the one god that they worship is essentially the same. Judaism is the oldest one, and the ancestor of the other two, but it also has the least number of followers. In AP World, we need to understand that Jews are generally minorities scattered throughout Christian and Muslim states, sometimes being tolerated and sometimes being persecuted. Christianity is the second episode of this Abrahamic trilogy. The most important figure is Jesus of Nazareth, who Christians call Christ, meaning Savior. He is both God and the Son of God, and he saves the souls of humanity. During 1200 to 1450, Christianity is most popular in Europe. While Europe is politically fragmented into many different states, they are culturally united by Christianity. Islam is the third installment of the Abrahamic trilogy. The key figure to them is the prophet Muhammad, who's referred to as the seal of the prophets, meaning that he's the last one. The major beliefs of Islam are summed up in the five pillars, which you either know already, or if you don't, you could check out my video about 1.2 culture. That was a good one. They're all excellent. A key feature of Islam is the concept of the Ummah, the Muslim community. This is a powerful idea that unifies Muslims. It also allows people from different states to interact with each other and find common ground, similar to how Christianity helps unite Europeans. The other three themes in Unit 1, economics, technology, and society, each only appear once in the unit. Let's start with economics. It only appears as a major economic focus in 1.1, and it's all about how China's economy becomes increasingly commercialized. So let's look at that word word commercialized. That means that they're making stuff for export, either other regions in China or to export to other countries. This is a big contrast to what we just learned about Europe's manor system, where almost everything is produced locally. 
Economically, China is ahead of the game during the Song Dynasty, and they have the biggest commercial economy in the world. They can do this largely through their technological innovations, such as the Grand Canal, which links northern and southern China together. The next theme is technology, which is only a thematic focus of 1.2 Dar al Islam. But of course, we just mentioned some of China's technological innovations, so we could still compare China and Dar al Islam as the two important regions for technology in Unit 1. In the Islamic world, they're doing two main things transfer transfers and innovations. Transfers means they're adopting other people's stuff. They especially liked ancient Greece, ancient India, and ancient Persia. And they're translating them into Arabic and Persian. They're also combining all of this knowledge and coming up with their own innovations. Innovations in mathematics, innovations in medicine, innovations in literature, and many more. Much of this innovation is possible because of the involvement of Muslim states, like the Abbasid Caliphate that built the House of Wisdom in Baghdad. Lastly, society. We only see this in 1.6 Europe. It seems like the College Board really just wants you to know about serfdom. My guess is that they want you to get a preview of coercive labor systems. Coercive labor systems basically refers to a system in which people are being forced to work, whether they like it or not, and they can't really do anything about it. Slavery is the most well-known type of coercive labor system, but it's not the only one. Serfs in Europe are not slaves. They're not the property of their landlords, and they also have certain rights. However, they are tied to the land, which means that they're not allowed to leave. They have to stay there and work there. This is different than than the free peasants in China who can go where they want to. But overwhelmingly, both free peasants and serfs are very poor and have very limited options. Not all of Europe has serfs. For example, you wouldn't find that many serfs in a city. But serfdom is still an important part of medieval European economics and society. So we've done a comparison for all the topics in Unit 1. But we also want to look more closely at the other two thinking processes, causation and continuity and change over time. Let's start with continuity and change. This is why even though Unit 1 technically begins in 1200, the College Board also wants you to be aware of some of the things that were happening before. That way you can see what has continued and what has changed. Let's go back to 1.1 China. China has many political continuities. Some of them include that China has been a highly centralized imperial state since the Qin Dynasty, and they've been using Confucianism in that state since the Han Dynasty. What about political changes in China? Well, a simple one is that the Song Dynasty is about to end in 1269. It's going to be replaced by the Yuan Dynasty, and the Yuan Dynasty is going to be replaced by the Ming Dynasty. All of these states fall within the period of 12 to 1450. Now let's talk about the civil service exam. Do you guys think that's a continuity or a change? Change. No, it's a continuity. Interesting. Explain your reasoning using evidence. It's a change because the Song Dynasty allowed everybody to take the test. No, it's a big continuity because it started all the way back in the Sui Dynasty and it continues through the Tang Dynasty and the Song Dynasty. Not the whole time. The Mongols in the Yuan Dynasty ended it temporarily. Change. But then the Ming Dynasty brought it back, and then it continued through the Ming and the Qing Dynasty. Continuity. It's so nice to see such a vigorous academic debate, but you're both right. Another example is the fragmentation of the Abbasid Caliphate. At first you had one big unified state under the Caliph in Baghdad, and now you've got a whole bunch of new states like the Seljuks and the Mamluks. That's a pretty big change. But the Muslim states continue to promote the expansion of Islam by supporting missionaries and by military conquest. Uh, the spread of Islam being supported and encouraged by Muslim states is a very important continuity. Continuity is perhaps an even bigger deal when it comes to cultural belief systems. For example, it says right here in the CED, Chinese cultural traditions continued. Confucianism, Taoism, filial piety, as well as Buddhism. Buddhism continues to be important in Southeast Asia as well, and Hinduism continues to flourish in South Asia. Some changes are that Buddhism experiences a significant decline in South Asia. Hinduism also declines in Southeast Asia. At the same time, Islam is on the rise in both South Asia and Southeast Asia. Asia. These are all significant cultural changes, even at the same time as other cultural traditions continue. It's a complex cultural mix. Christianity continues to be a big deal in Europe as well. Before we get to the exam examples, let's finish up with causation. Again, starting with China, let's look at economics. The economy of Song China flourished as a result of... This is a clue for us that we're talking about causation. So China's economy is flourishing during the Song Dynasty. Why is it flourishing? What is the cause of this economic flourishing? Technological innovations. 
Yes, that's an example of how one of the historical themes, in this case technology, has an impact on one of the other historical themes, in this case economics. For example, the Grand Canal and other infrastructure allows trade inside of China to increase. More goods can be transported to farther away places. And by the way, who builds the Grand Canal? The Song Dynasty government. Yes, so if you're paying attention and looking closely, you can see that actually there is a political cause for the technology which causes economic growth. That's thinking like the college board. That's how you get a five. Speaking of the political role, let's take a look at Dar al-Islam again. States like the Abbasid Caliphate and those Turkic states are actively encouraging technological innovations, largely by paying people to do research and building the places for them to do it. Like the House of Wisdom built by the Abbasid Caliphate. Exactly. I think you guys are ready for some real life AP exam examples. How about it? This is my favorite part of the review. Let's take a look at this short answer question from the 2021 exam. Identify one continuity in the political system of China in the period 1200 to 1750. Uh, Mr. Eicher, didn't we only cover 1200 to 1450? Yes, but that's not a problem. You can use your knowledge up to 1450 to answer all parts of this question. So let's see what you guys have come up with. For you kids at home, you can pause the video and come up with your own answers. Okay, so here are some examples that the College Board gives us. Wow, good thing we've already talked about all of those things in this video and our previous videos about 1.1. Do we need to remember all that? For this question, you only need to remember one of them, but it's a good idea for you to know as much relevant content as you can. What about part B? Identify one change in the political system of China in the period 1200 to 1750. Pause again and see if you can answer this one. Most of this stuff is from unit two, but the Jin dynasty, those nomads who ruled north of China during the Song dynasty, we did talk about them. And finally, part C. Part C is usually the trickiest part of the SAQ. Let's see if we can get that one with the knowledge that we have. You can go ahead and pause again if you like. Uh, Mr. Eicher, does that mean we only have to write one sentence for the short answer questions? I'm glad you asked. Technically, there may be times when one sentence answers earn the point, but we never recommend writing just one sentence. We recommend using the ACE system. Step one, answer the question. That usually involves a little rephrasing of the question and then ending with your answer. For example, let's look at part A. Your response should begin something like this. Then you put your answer here. For example, the imperial bureaucracy. Cite the evidence. Here you might say, the imperial bureaucracy existed since even before the Song Dynasty and was used by later dynasties like the Yuan and the Ming. Then the explain part. This shows that the imperial bureaucracy continued in political structures of China over many centuries. Here's how it would look for part B. So let's see how the ACE system works for part C. Let's stick with an example that we already know from our unit one content. So something to do with the Song Dynasty. We know that China is involved in overseas trade on the Silk Roads and Indian Ocean trade networks. It's not hard to see how that would influence the global economy. But what does this have to do with political continuities? Well, as we mentioned, the Grand Canal and other infrastructure projects are government sponsored projects and China will continue to invest in infrastructure during this time period. So here's what I'd say following the ACE format. One political continuity in China that influenced global economic development in 1200 to 1750 was the government investing in infrastructure like the Grand Canal. The Grand Canal and other infrastructure projects allowed products from all over China to be moved across greater distances, which could be exported to global trade networks such as the Silk Roads and Indian Ocean trade networks. The government's investment in infrastructure therefore had a significant impact on the global economy by impacting other regions that used these trade routes. That seems pretty difficult. Fortunately, you don't have to get every part of every SAQ right to get a five, but if you get really good at them and do get most of the points, it can really improve your score. And if you don't get good at them and don't get points, it can really hurt your score. So just do the ACE format. Take the time and get the points, okay? Mr. Eichert, can we please do some multiple choice questions too? 
Sadly, the College Board does not publish past multiple choice questions to the public, but we can look at some examples from the CED. Let's look at the first set. Now, I recommend you don't just read the source they give. Skip that and only read what you need. You only have one minute per question. Go right to the source line. Many people skip this, which is not a smart move. This is the most important part. So this is Hungary. We know that's in Europe, and we know that it involves the Catholic Church. So we're in topic 1.6 most likely. Question one, which of the following features of Europe in the period circa 1200 to 1450 most directly contributed to the fact that the King of Hungary did not receive the military assistance that he requested in 1241 as mentioned in the third paragraph? So let's read the third paragraph. When the Mongols invaded in 1241, we sent requests for military aid to the papacy, the Holy Roman Emperor, the King of France, and others, but from all of them we received only words of support. We, for shame, resorted to inviting pagan Kumans into our kingdom. Now why aren't these states helping this poor Hungarian king who is asking for help. This is where our knowledge of the content comes in. Hmm, let's look at A. Is Europe divided into numerous feudal states? Yes, that's one of the only things you really need to know from 1.6. These other choices are all outside the time period, except for B, which is about trade unions, which is not really relevant to getting military assistance to fight the Mongols. So we know the answer is A. Question two. Bella the fourth statement in the fourth paragraph that the Hungarian people cannot cease to be amazed by the actions of the papacy most directly refers to the papacy's failure to aid the Hungarians while... Okay, so let's just go to the fourth paragraph and skip right to the part where it says they cannot cease to be amazed. The people in our kingdom cannot cease to be amazed that you offer substantial help to the Christian territories overseas, which, if they were lost, would not harm the inhabitants of Europe more than if our kingdom fell. So we know that he's talking about the Pope helping Christians overseas and outside of Europe. He sounds like the Crusades. A, no. We didn't talk about that because that doesn't come up until Unit 3. B, Iberian Peninsula. Hopefully you know that's in Spain, which is in Europe, but if you don't, skip it and find something that you do know. C, European military campaigns in the Middle East. Yes, that's definitely the Crusades. That's the answer. D is also outside the time period. We'll see this in Unit 4. Number three, all of the following statements are factually accurate. Which would best explain Bella the Fourth's reasoning for inviting the Cumans into Hungary as mentioned in the third paragraph. So let's go back to the third paragraph again, or maybe we don't even need to read it again. We can already tell this passage is a desperate king asking for help to fight the Mongols. So why does he get help from the Kumans? All of these things are true, but which of them makes them most helpful for fighting against the Mongols? A. Okay, not really that helpful for fighting Mongols. B. Interesting bit of trivia, but doesn't really help fighting the Mongols. Hmm, C. That could maybe be helpful? D. Oh, that's definitely helpful. That's the answer. So the Mongols are actually a Unit 2 topic, but we've managed to answer all of these questions without even knowing anything about the Mongols, and without even reading the whole source. That's thinking like the College Board. Oh, Mr. Eichard, can we do an LEQ too? The LEQ usually requires knowledge of whole time periods. So we'll wait till the Unit 2 review video to do an LEQ about 1200 to 1450. So that's it for the Unit 1 review. We've covered all the important points from all of the topics in Unit 1, and we also did some multiple choice and short answer exam practice. If some of the things I mentioned to you in this video are not review and they're completely new and you feel like you don't know anything about it and you need to know more, Please, I encourage you to watch my other videos about these specific topics. If you found it useful, please subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.